Good day, it's Tony Fortunato and Paul Offord. It's a different kind of show today. As Paul eloquently said in one of his messages, we've hijacked the show. Unfortunately, Tim and Denny are not here, so you'll have to put up with us for 30 minutes. And what we're gonna do today is, uh, <laughs> we're going to uh, break the show up into two uh, sections, if you will. I'm gonna cover the first few minutes and then Paul's gonna jump into some Tribe Lab stuff that he has for us. All right, so here we go. I'm going to a few minutes and then Paul's going to jump into some tribe lab stuff that he has for us. Oh, I think, Paul, is that your feedback on your end? Um, yeah, I'm getting some echo and I'm not quite sure why. If you have a YouTube application up, make sure you mute your volume in YouTube. Otherwise, you'll hear me yapping away. There you go. That's the wonders of a live show, folks. Here we go. We've got my article that I uh, posted on network computing back on the third and uh, people were very interested in it and it was called the Cisco router speed test and the only thing I want to review is the whole concept of throughput testing uh, because I've actually had a few people ask me about it when you do throughput testing primarily you're going to use uh, TCP as your throughput protocol of choice um, you can use UDP you can technically do that but practically speaking it's not really a good thing to do. Uh, YouTube, uh, you, YouTube. <laughs> UDP is going to be connectionless, obviously. So I always encourage people, if you're going to do some kind of quality test, latency, jitter, packet loss, then great, you can use UDP. But if you want to do some raw throughput tests, you should probably stick to TCP. Some vendors out there have their own proprietary way of doing it, and it might be wrapped within UDP, but nevertheless, the majority of the stuff will run on TCP. So in this example, I used iPerf, and I ran a test through a router. And the reason why we did this test is the client um, has some current equipment. We're going to upgrade the WAN link, and he was asking, um, how, do I, how do I make sure it can handle it? Because I'm the one who brought that up a few weeks earlier. And I said, well, let's just take two computers, because we're out in the field. We don't have access to fancy equipment. Two laptops, we plugged the laptops back to back, and we ran an iPerf just to make sure the laptops can go well over 100 meg, and, and they did. 100 meg is the magic number because that's what the new service is going to be. And then we simply connected the router between the two laptops. The first test was the router with a routing test. And you can see that um, upload and download was well over 100, you know, 750s and the 850s. Uh, so the router itself can perform quite well. This touches another point as we were doing this, we pulled up the Cisco spec sheet on the router and it was telling us the performance statistics, but unfortunately when you read the details, it says based on 64 byte packets. We all know that on your network, 64 byte packets are just the minimum size and the majority of the stuff is gonna be way bigger than that, hopefully. So basically we wanted to redo the tests. And the second test we did was going through the router and we had NAT enabled. And the reason why that's important is it's um, an ISP and relatively small network, and it's in one of those uh, head ends, those sheds that where you don't have a lot of real estate or power, right? Both are major considerations. So they NAT through the router, which works just fine. They don't need separate boxes for that. And sure enough, when we did the NAT test, that's when things started to look a little interesting. And you can see here on the upload side, it was well over 400 meg, and on the um, the inside and the outside is basically, I'm sorry, the way I did it, and 200 meg the other way. And it was interesting to me to see that when you change the test points, if you were coming into the router or out of the router, how that affected throughput. Um, again, we're well over 100, so that's fantastic. But um, it was interesting to know that you know anywhere near the 200 range is going to start to cause us some issues. Uh, this raises a lot of questions for my client because he was originally told by another consultant the routers are old, they're not supported, just buy new ones. And, and his take on it, like all small ISPs and small companies out there, they say, well, if the stuff works, then why do I got to keep taking it uh, Because the cost of replacing it far exceeds the cost of the actual equipment. Then you have to schedule maintenance windows, configuration, testing, and all that kind of nonsense, right? So this was um, a really interesting little example. And I encourage people to do these types of tests uh, with anything. Uh, even at home, if you have Wi-Fi, run an iPerf, um, you know, have a machine connected to your network wired and have your phone, your Android, your Apple, your laptop, walk around the kitchen, the, the garage, the, the living room, wherever you happen to go and try to find out what performance you get without having to worry about 
for example, the specifications of your RSSI, signal to noise ratio, and all that kind of nonsense. At the end of the day, I'm trying to find out the real mileage. What's the real mileage on the real equipment with the real configuration? Uh, because I've seen, and Paul's probably seen this as well, you might have a server and they'll put antivirus application A on it. And then as soon as they do that, things go mysteriously slow. And nobody would have ever thought that a piece of software on a server could cause such a huge performance hit or a firewall, those sorts of things. So I'm trying to get people to think about performance. I'm trying to get people to understand that it's not a big deal. You could just run iPerf as a simple test. And of course, the more complicated you want to make it, you can always buy other uh, vendors' equipment that will run these tests for you and get into SLA testing and RFC 2544 testing. But step one, just get some iPerf, get two computers, uh, and go. Just give it a shot. That's it. When you use iPerf, Tony, Tony, Tony um, do you um, run mixed traffic types? Sometimes. Sometimes um, I'll run parallel um, streams. Sometimes I'll um, basically try to mix up the traffic. Um, and in some rare instances, I'll actually have two instances of iPerf running on the server, TCP and UDP, and we'll run multiple tests as well. I've also written other articles where you know you use RoboCopy and XCopy, and you try to copy a file, and you, you have an idea of technically and mathematically how long it should take. And you say, wow, it should take five minutes. It took seven minutes. And guess what? That means it's slow. Or you might say, that's fine. So yeah, to answer your first question, I mix traffic when I have to. But the very first test, I just leave everything alone for defaults, just, uh, just for testing purposes. Yeah, that sounds cool. That's, um, I, think, I think you're right that just with some simple tests, you should be able to establish at least some form of baseline. And um, I know that actually we've been looking at uh, a problem with a, uh, it's a transfer system. What they're doing is they're migrating uh, data from one part of the data center to the other through this particular solution. And uh, they've had some performance problems with that. And what was useful was they had a, a lab environment where they had sort of benchmark performance. And then in the live environment, it was performing vastly differently, um, very slowly actually. And once uh, my colleague started to do some tracing, he could immediately see a change, a, a difference in the pattern of the traffic flows, which I think is uh, really useful. Um, but I think if you can do, uh, yeah, if you can do testing like that, that's got to be good. Yeah, and, and I think the last thing that I, I kind of I forgot to throw into the mix is when we do iPerf testing, the reason why I like to do iPerf testing, the primary reason, is I'm trying to stay away from touching the disk, right? Because in some cases, the disk is yeah. the highest form of latency. Um, so yeah. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of saying, you know what, let's just do it via RAM. iPerf is super small, mm -hmm. super lightweight, stays in memory. Uh, and then later on, if you want to test your disk subsystem, your RAID array or your NAS or SAN or whatever you're trying to do, then fine, we can mm -hmm. overlay that. But it's kind of step one, like what's the best we can get yeah. theoretically? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you... Um when you do it with iPerf, can you change protocols, or is it simply just blasting data and reflecting it, or can you use HTTP or FTP or, or different sorts of protocols? Good question. Um, no, when you go into the default mode, is TCP, and it just blasts a bunch of bits, and that's pretty well the end of it. Okay. Um, and then you can go to UDP mode, which, again, blasts a bunch of bits. So yeah, yeah to, to your point, I like using um, other tools like wget, for example, to pull a file yeah. down using HTTP and that sort of thing. Yeah. But for, for checking pure IP performance, like through the router like you did, it's ideal. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and Wi-Fi. I've been a lot of my, because, you know, apparently I know something about computers, so my friends always ask me why their wireless is slow. And <laughs> so uh, basically, I'll, I'll show them that, hey, look, we're in the kitchen, for example. Let's do a throughput test, and you're only getting a meg. And then that usually translates to, oh, wow, that's why I can't stream Netflix, or that's why the kids are screaming at me, uh, that sort of thing. So when, when you try to correlate a test to something people understand, like throughput, then guess what? Then all of a sudden, they care. And then we find out you know, interference, channel settings, whatever it happens to be. But then now we got a number, right? You can always compare a number on a number and find out if you really did make a positive change sure, rather than sure. you think it made a difference, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Sounds good. That's it. So you, Paul, what have you got for us, my friend? Um, I was going to give you an update on uh, the status of the Workbench project. Um, 
So let's uh, sort out my screen share. So I hope you can see the workbench application in the... Uh... Oh, Paul, just a, a quick note, because we do have a few viewers. Uh, since we're doing this um, through YouTube with their new features, they have a chat window open in the side of your YouTube video. It says live chat. So if anybody has any questions, by all means, you can throw them up on the live chat. Uh, sometimes people email me direct. That's fine, too. So feel free to throw your questions in as you see fit. Thanks. Go ahead, Paul. Sorry. OK, cool. Can you see my, um, my workbench application? Yes, sir. OK, good. So um, for those of you who have uh, downloaded Workbench, this will probably look um, pretty familiar to you. Um, the changes, we've, we've come up with some uh, new features which um, we find quite exciting, and I hope you do too. Um, they're, they're useful in us being able to process different types of uh, data files with tools that are familiar to us. Um, and we've also done some improvements around uh, the way that you can pass parameters to a tool. And I'll show you what that means in practice. So if I uh, take a file, um, if I take, I think you've seen me do this before. This is a, a trace file that was captured using the netshell trace command in what, uh, Windows. And Wireshark does not natively support that data type. But in Workbench, we can drag and drop Wireshark onto the data. <laughs> I don't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> Shades of Bill Gates when he did that with Windows. Oh, yeah, well, you know, why, why, why bother doing a live demo? That has worked <laughs> over and over again all day. Well, Paul, while we're waiting for that, could you uh, just do me a favor? Somebody actually sent me a message and saying, what is Workbench? What is that? So can okay. you give us a, a quick overview of what that is while we're waiting? Sure. So Workbench is um, a, a tool. It's really a desktop environment that integrates data, tools, and workflow. Now, what that means is that we can organize data that we might be analyzing in any way we want, in the way that suits us, and then we can use a whole raft of tools against that data and we can actually do that under the guidance of a workflow so i'll show the workflow at the end if we get the time um, but you can see that we have this area here called object explorer and we can open up a workspace so it's a particular project that we've been working on and here we have a whole bunch of data um, that we can uh, access and you can see i've got all sorts of things in here so i've got network traces of various types I've got perfmon logs from uh, Windows servers. I've got process monitor logs from um, a PC. I've got some web logs, and I've even got video. And I can use this data in conjunction with these tools up here in the toolbox, and so I can explore all these different data types. Now, one of the things we're trying to do with Workbench is we're trying to enable people to explore data types with the tools that are familiar to them. So for example, this web log here, I can take that web log and it's a straightforward uh, log out of a web server and I can drop Wireshark onto it and it opens in Wireshark and I can go and explore the web log data just as though it were a, a network trace file. So it will um, populate, you know, create all these different variables, which means that if I say I wanted to just pick out that URI, I can do the usual things, I can apply that as a filter and say select that, and you can see it just picks up those entries. So for those of us who are familiar with Wireshark, it's great because now I can take a, a web log out of the Microsoft IAS server and I can start exploring it using Wireshark. Um, particularly useful when you're investigating a problem with say, um, encrypted uh, SSL packets. There's only so much we can do with the packets, but if we can then tie those together and start to look at the web logs, then you can see that we can uh, go that bit further and, and understand what's going on. So Workbench uses this concept of transformers, which you see over here, which transforms data from one type to another. 
So what happened in the background, when I dragged and dropped that onto there, uh, what actually happened was that Workbench did a transformation in the background and then loaded the transformed version into Wireshark. That's why up here you see that it appears to be a PCAP-NG file. Um, so, uh, sorry, I should zoom in on that. So we can see up here, it's a PCAP-NG file, just there. So um, we can, in the same way, we can do things like uh, drag this NetShell trace command, and we'll have another go with it. And I can drag and drop Wireshark onto that file. And again, it opens, and you can again see that Wireshark has done a transformation into uh, a PCAP NG file again. It's operating quite quickly at the moment because what it actually does is it caches the transformation. So when I do something new, it actually has to run the transformation, although most of them run very quickly. Um, but you can see down here that it's actually found a cached version. Um, and so it was able to load the uh, transform version directly out of the cache. Paul, do you need um, any special hardware requirements, like a beefy machine or just an everyday laptop or desktop that you use for work would probably fit the bill? Any, any 64-bit machine would do the job. Normal memory, and if you can, if you, if you can uh, stretch to an SSD disk, that's, that's great, and that improves performance. But this machine I'm using at the moment is my old machine, um, and it's not SSD. It's a, this is a Dell Inspire on oh no, Dell Latitude E5550. It's quite an old machine now, but it performs perfectly well. Um, Good to know. So because this, these transformations are happening in the background, it will work with any application. So here I've got Trace Wrangler. Now Trace Wrangler is, is a, a great tool produced by Jasper von Goetz, uh, for anonymizing trace files. And Trace Wrangler supports PCAP and PCAP-NG, the, the Wireshark versions. But because this transformation can happen in the background, I can drag and drop Trace Wrangler onto this file. And I've actually set it up to automatically run an anonymized task. And you can see it's already done it. So it's anonymized the data and stored away the anonymized version. So this drag and drop capability and the whole this is how we really are building Workbench with a drag and drop paradigm, really. The, it's the ability to drag and drop anything onto anything. So another thing I can do is I can take Excel, and this is the new feature. This, if I drag and drop Excel onto here, this has to go through two transformations, one to transfer, transform uh, the ETL file into a PCAP-NG file, and a second one to actually convert that PCAP-NG file into a CSV file. So now you can chain these transformations together, and this is the, uh, one of the new features. So I could have a transformation that had 20 steps in it, in theory, if I wanted to. And so you can see I can, open, I can directly open a network trace file in Excel, and I can start to play with the uh, trace file. So that's one of the new features. The other one, which I'll also demonstrate with um, Trace Wrangler, is we're trying, to, um, we're trying to build greater sophistication into the wrappers that we put around these tools. And there were some things you couldn't do with the previous version of Workbench. And one of the things was that under certain circumstances, you couldn't pass a list of files to a tool in the toolbox. So we've corrected that now. So if I grab a, some t you can see I have uh, some here. I'm going to actually get rid of that one to speed things up. So here I have a file set. It has two trace files in it. I can take the, tri the file set actually as an object in its own right. And then I can take Trace Wrangler, drop it on there, and it will start to process the uh, data. Now this takes a little time because um, it has to do an indexing job first and then it does the anonymization. But uh, take my word for it, it does all work, it does complete and it produces an anonymized um, data. Now the, th the bit we like here, and this is really the, the reason for using um, 
for building the whole uh, workbench uh, tool is to really make things easy and fast. That's what we're trying to do with this. So we're looking for speed and for simplicity. Um, and this ability to be able to just drag and drop um, a tool onto, say, a whole set of files, we find that particularly attractive. And it, it certainly does make things a lot easier. So those are the, uh, the two things uh, that we put in that will be in the next release. So that next release will probably be uh, available on Friday this week. Um, barring us discovering more problems like the one I just discovered when it crashed. Um, but uh, that shouldn't happen. Um, so I thought I'd just also touch on, uh, oh, I, I should really touch on the uh, workflow because somebody asked about that. So we have workflows that can do certain things. So for example, I've got a workflow that can um, determine the application response time using this tool called Transum. And uh, what I can do is I can start a new instance of that workflow, or I can go and look at existing instances, and you can see that I've got one. And I can uh, activate this workflow. You can see it's over here in this area here. And basically, it's an expert guide helping us understand how we um, analyze a problem. And two things about it. The first one is that it adapts as we go through the workflow. So depending on how you answer the various questions that you're prompted, it takes different paths through the workflow. And also it adds context to the workflow. So it's not just a static list of instructions. Because you can see here that at one point we asked what was the name of the user who experienced the problem. And then you can see from that point on, we're referring to that person. His name is Mark. We're referring to him directly within the workflow. Again, we ask for the name of the application back here. It says, when you're accessing this application, call Contozo. And then once we enter the IP address, it will explicitly refer to the IP address. So this avoids ambiguity and also makes it much easier to follow the workflow and makes the workflow a lot less wordy. So we've got uh, a lot of work going on in that area, in the workflow area. So that's cool. the does workflow. It take, does it take a Sorry? lot of uh, programming experience or fiddling around to create your own workflow? Or At the moment, you can't create your own workflow. We've had to create uh, some as samples. We're working on a public interface for the workflow. And uh, basically, it's going to be drag and drop. So you'll drag. Uh, boxes onto the workflow, join them up, and then you'll be prompted for certain information, which you'll enter, and uh, that will that will be how you build a workflow. And the um, uh, transformers that we saw earlier, same thing, Paul, or can you do one of those on your own? Yeah, the transformers. Some of them, um, a couple of them are built in. So this this one called Babel is a built-in transformer. Uh, this one here is simply the relog program um, that's available on every Windows PC. Mm -hmm. um, this one is log parser and so what I can do is I can go in and add my own transformers um, and they just comprise of what what uh, Barry our head developer calls ins and outs so we have something going in and we have something coming out and uh, you can see it's a fairly straightforward definition um, this is the uh, log parser command you can see that at any time we detect a log file and we want to convert it to a CSV, then this will be offered as a way of doing it. And then we've just got a couple of things down here that say, what are these uh, parameters uh, here, you know, here and here. Right. So pretty simple stuff. We want to make it as simple as possible. So you can, can add your own transformers. There are some in the uh, user documentation for the product. Um, and there are, there's also guidance in that uh, user guide telling you how to add your own transformers. Um, I've got a colleague who's just producing, Jonathan is working on wrapping various commands in PowerShell scripts and using them as transformers. And he's churning out one transformer after another. So it's gonna be interesting to see what he comes up with. Um, 
so yes it's it's supposed to be flexible i mean the whole concept is you can add any any tool into the toolbox you can add any transformer into the transformer container you can add any object into the object explorer and you can add any workflow into the workflow environment so that's would, where we're heading would this be something that people you suspect would go back and go to the tribe lab community and tell people here's a transformer i created uh, try this try that share tips and tricks and that sort of thing absolutely absolutely we want there to be a community feel to this that's why we want to build the public workflow um, interface and what we're going to do you'll have a choice whether you want to keep your workflow private or public but you'll have the choice to publish it to the community so that you can share the workflows around and you can see that that way we can tap into the expertise of you know yourself and Chris Greer and Hansang and and Betty and you know Laura and all the all the good and the great and um, you know get get some idea of how they work and then program that into the workflow so that anybody can follow their workflow um, and when we find shortcomings in the workflow we simply plug the gap we just modify the workflow and make it uh, cope with uh, the new scenario right I guess my uh, my last question is the um, the whole when you talked about, you know, you've got perfmon logs, you've got some IIS logs, you've got, you know, all the various types of data sources, just for lack of a better term. Sure. Um, have you got information on Tribe Lab or anywhere to show people who may not be familiar with how to get an IIS log or how to use um, perfmon or procmon, that sort of thing, so they can get the, the various data files that they may not even be aware they can get? Sure, we, we have. Um, Probably not as much as I'd like, but we certainly have got uh, quite a lot of information and you would find that on the Tribe Lab site. Um, and you find it in the area, oh sorry, Oops, let's go back there. Ah, I tell you what, I'm, when I go back to my old PC, I keep hitting all the wrong keys. It's terrible. <laughs> I do that all the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, okay. We have, we have this area here, uh, Guide to Network Trace Capture. Mm -hmm. So that's got an awful lot of information about capturing network traces. But we also have a guide to using Process Monitor. Uh, so you, you find that here, and there are, there's a series of uh, videos. This is actually quite a popular video series, I have to say. I get a lot of... Um, a lot of comments on this, a lot of uh, questions. So we've got, uh, you know, a sequence of eight or nine um, videos there to uh, guide people into the use of Process Monitor. I take your point on IIS logs. That's a very good point, and I've never really posted anything to say this is how you get, uh, you know, a web log. Um, and I think that's something that I, I definitely would like to add. Um, so thanks. I'll take that on board and, and do something about that. Sure. I just find that sometimes when I teach people about these logs and they're network people, they may have never done it. They may not know what's involved in getting it. Sure. Uh, and it just becomes, you know, more work than it's supposed to be for the guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Definitely. Definitely. And and the thing is, it is so easy. <laughs> that's yeah. that's the crying shame, you know. It's yeah. very easy to do. So last year, some of you will remember that we had a, um, a proof of concept um, products that matched trace files so here you can see a match of trace trace files uh, captured at four different points in a network and basically we do a packet by packet match so that we can actually show uh, where the uh, traffic is flowing through each of the files now this was our original proof of concept we're called trace matcher and what we're doing is we've had a lot of uh, questions about where's trace matcher why isn't it in workbench um it's always been intended to be there in fact the engine to do it has been in the background all along we just didn't wire it up to the user interface so um i set this as a priority for the developers and in fact yesterday they sent me this screenshot showing how they'd actually got trace matcher into workbench and how they'd um, actually successfully run a four-way match. Um, we have some tidying up to do on this, so this won't be in this Friday's release, but I'm expecting this to uh, 
be available very soon. I want to get this out as soon as possible. Sh certainly before sh Shark is, um, I'm going to Shark Fest this year. I'm going to do a presentation on Workbench and I'd like to um, certainly include a presentation on the use of uh, the matching function. So at that, I think I'm, I'm done, Tony. Uh, awesome. If I can just stop my screen sharing. <laughs> uh, uh, do I stop that? Come on. Um, you must be able to wait. Oh, yeah. Like that. Follow spells, use a hammer. Hey, hey. Awesome. So wow. that was our, our first show together, Paul. I think it went well. Sorry? Yeah. Apart from the crash. We'll ignore the crash. <laughs> I'll edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks very much, Paul, and uh, thanks for everybody for giving us a bit of your time today, and we'll see you at the next show. Have a good day. Yeah, thanks, Tommy. Bye.